Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Charles and I work at Snowflake. And today I would love to tell you more about our service mesh adoption stories at Snowflake, specifically because Snowflake product is multi-cloud. It means our infrastructure also has to be multi-cloud. So uh, a sizable amount of challenges that we face actually uh, stem from this multi-cloud uh, or cloud agnostic requirements. Um, going too fast. Uh, before we move in, uh, just a bit more about me. I work on the container platform team at Snowflake. Um, joined Snowflake like more than two years ago. And uh, before Snowflake, I was at Cruise, also doing container stuff. Um, Cruise is a self-driving car startup. And before Cruise, I was actually at Google building the SDO uh, open source project. So been in, the, in this domain for a little bit. Um, so first, I want to tell you a bit more about Snowflake. Um, we went public like two years ago, uh, but Snowflake started as a data warehouse. It does big data analytics, um, but now it brands itself as the data cloud. It does data sharing, um, machine learnings, and basically everything related to data. Um, there are four properties that I think stands out for Snowflake in general. First is multi-cloud. As of today, we support Azure, GCP, and AWS, and may be adding more in the future. Uh, it's multi-tenant. Snowflake has more than one customers, uh, and sometimes more than one more than one customers would share um, the same compute resources. And it's multi-region. We want our um, compute resources to be co-located with our customers' workloads. And lastly, it's multi-environment. Uh, we're supporting commercial deployments as well as um, government cloud, there are workloads that has to comply with uh, ITAR or uh, FedRAN FIPS uh, compliances, and that means our deployments and infrastructure uh, have, to be, uh, have to conform to those compliance as well. And all those four properties about Snowflake products also apply to our infrastructure. Um, so that's a uh, source of the complexity for sure. Um, specifically about container platform, as of today, we run 170 clusters. Uh, those are Kubernetes clusters, and we expect to build a lot more in the future. Uh, we intentionally try to limit the size of the cluster, trying to limit the blast radius. Uh, so we're orchestrating hundreds of clusters as herd uh, instead of pads. Uh, that means we also have uh, a strong requirements of building scalable, resilient uh, automations uh, to do really simple things like cluster upgrades or upgrading all the open source components that we deployed on the clusters like external DNS or cert manager. Um, we are using the cloud provider managed Kubernetes. So uh, they take care of the control planes and we manage uh, the worker nodes and all the workloads and the open source components we deploy onto them. So that's one last thing we have to worry about uh, it's multi-tenant, just like Snowflake product, um, in terms of namespace and also applications running in the cluster. Sometimes the same node could run 20, 30 different containers, and uh, they're from different namespace, different applications. Uh, lastly, because Snowflake is founded in 2012, and that's before Kubernetes was a thing. Uh, so we still have some applications running on VM-based infrastructure. We just need to make sure that uh, VM-based infrastructure can interoperate with the container environment. Um, and because of this multi-cloud archi architecture, it's very important for us to as much as we could to preserve this cloud agnostic abstraction because the benefit is that the abstraction would prevent uh, fragmentation and proliferation of identities, policies, and toolings. Um, for example, imagine having different cloud provider CLI tools in order to connect to a Kubernetes cluster um, and having, having to use different cloud provider identities uh, to authenticate yourself and manage all the credentials uh, associated with those. And around policies, like, uh, for example, on GCP, I would want to configure some firewall rules um, on each host, but on AWS, it's called security group rules, which is achieving similar features, but they are drastically different API calls, um, and authentication is managed differently. And all those little pieces, they're, they're creating 
uh, uh, frictions in terms of building automations. Like essentially you're writing the same code three times if you want to support <laughs> three cloud providers. Uh, so having some cloud agnostic abstractions really reduced the complexity for both development and operation. And service mesh is a key part of it. And part of the reason is that we can push uh, this policy up into this cloud agnostic layer. For Istio, for example, we can define our traffic routing, security, telemetries, and all that into the Istio uh, API groups instead of defining that using GCP specific calls. Same thing is true for Calico network policies, and that's layer four layer, uh, network policies, and that's specifically for applications running outside of the mesh. Um, OPA Gatekeeper is a very flexible and powerful tools for us to define policies, like we only want this list of container images uh, from this list of hosts to be running on this cluster, for example. Um, instead of having three different CLI tools to access VM or Kubernetes, we use Teleport uh, to manage the, the, the access and also integrate it with Okta for identity and group membership. Uh, we're using group membership mostly for RBAC and uh, access uh, policy definition. And lastly, we use Snowflake internally to uh, query the logs and, and ingesting the metrics as well as defining uh, alerts. Uh, well, speaking of doc within your own product. Okay, uh, I wanna dive into the service mesh adoption story right now. And I wanna begin with uh, auto scaling the ingress gateway. Now, obviously you want to auto scale your ingress gateway because your traffic is pretty much unpredictable. And also during the night and weekends, the traffic are relatively small. You want to save money uh, by auto scaling. And I want to tell you why it is more than just slap and horizontal pod auto scaling uh, setting to your ingress gateway and call it a day. And the reason is because we want to preserve the source IP address at layer three. Um, preserving the source IP is important for rate limiting and also allow list policy enforcement. And uh, the export for HTTP header is susceptible for spoofing. And we also have TCP services uh, that doesn't speak HTTP. So we want the IP address at layer three. But we are, we're having this special setup where the gateway pods are fronted by a layer four load balancer. Why layer four? Because routing the traffic directly to pause, which GCP calls cloud native load balancing, uh, is not a feature supported by all the cloud providers. And we do uh, want uh, some consistency across cloud. And we realized that a layer four load balancer is, um, has the most feature parity across cloud. And for layer four load balancer, it has this uh, interesting behavior where traffic is routed to the nodes, um, essentially a node port, and then is IP tabled by the queue proxy to the pods. So there's like one extra hop uh, on the nodes and then to the pods. And this behavior comes uh, important when it comes to IP address preservation. And uh, the traditional L4 load balancer setup um, has this uh, a periodic health check to the nodes to make sure that there are actual pods on the nodes serving the traffic. And on AWS, it happens maybe every 20 seconds. This is configurable, but this is a non-zero delay. And that means life cycle management for gateway pods is very challenging because when the pod is terminated on node N, uh, the load balancer would, would keep sending traffic to node N until node N is marked as unhealthy. Um, and during that short period, your clients could receive 503s or just IO timeout because there's no response. And this is shameful to say, but for a while, we don't have auto scaling setups. We just over provision the Istio ingress gateways. And in order to preserve the source IP, here's our setup. Uh, we run the Istio gateways as daemon sets. Um, and we have a dedicated node pool for Istio, uh, and within that pool, every node had an ingress gateway pod running on it uh, to handle the traffic. And we set the external traffic policy to local. So there's no additional hops between the nodes where the traffic actually, the, when the traffic leaves the L4 load balancer and hits the first node, that's the node that's going to handle the requests. Um, otherwise, if there's additional bouncing, 
off of other nodes, uh, like the last point right here, the source IP address will be added to the proxy node. And that will break your uh, rate limiting or allow list policy. And, uh, but at some point we need to terminate Istio gateway pods for upgrading Istio or uh, upgrading the node pools underlying the, uh, that's running the Istio pods. Um, the way to do it safely without dropping traffic is that we first need to deregister the hosting node from the cloud load balancer and making sure that the deregistration completes. And then we issue the pod delete request. And there's a way to do so in a cloud agnostic way by applying this node label um, and then cording the node. But of course, you have to develop some custom tooling to uh, basically pull the cloud provider API to make sure that the registration completes successfully because everything happens asynchronously. So, but we really want all the scaling because of the cost saving and also uh, just to be safe when there's a traffic spike hitting us. Uh, our first design is almost a perfect straw man and, and feels very intuitive and easy to implement, um, which is to use an admission webhook to intercept all the pod delete requests for the gateway uh, ingress pod, and then just hold that request and at the same time deregister the, the node that's hosting the pod uh, from the load balancer. And when the deregistration completes, uh, release the pod delete request. Um, the, the showstopper is that on Kubernetes, the admission webhook has a 30 second max timeout after which the, re, the, re, the pod delete request will be released regardless. And 30 seconds is not enough to ensure that the node has been deregistered successfully. So where do we go from here? There are three possible solutions. The first is to explore eBPF data plane to replace the IP table based uh, queue proxy, which has the really nice property of still retaining the source IP address despite setting the external traffic policy to cluster so that you can place your pod on any node you like and the traffic will be evenly split and you don't have to worry about uh, IP source IP being changed. Um, but for us specifically at Snowflake, we are curious whether uh, ARM64 architecture is supported and whether this is FIPS compliant. Um, and if not, we have to figure out um, either build our custom distro or if this is a, a showstopper for us. Uh, for those that you don't know or don't deal with federal uh, customers, FIPS, FIPS compliant is basically requiring um, all the tools and systems that you run to adopt a uh, federal approved implementation of all the cryptographic libraries. Um, the native Go crypto library is not FIPS compliant, so you have to build your application differently. Um, the second option is to use a custom NOPOL autoscaler that pretty much just work around the 30 second restriction that I talked about for the uh, admission webhook. Um, but because this is on a NOPOL autoscaler layer, there's really not a timeout uh, around node deregistration. And lastly, there's a Kubernetes enhancement proposal uh, trying to address this exact issue that I just described. The issue is that it's going to be a long wait. Um, it's going to take at least a few releases for this feature to be uh, ready and roll out. And then the cl client and the cloud provider is going to take a few more quarters to actually adopt um, that release. The second challenge I want to tell you more about is day two challenge of upgrading Istio. Um, this is, uh, we want to do so in a safe way, which is uh, a blue green fashion. And we have to do this upgrade sometimes several times in a quarter because uh, Istio often releases patch uh, releases that address CVEs and also the minor release might uh, go out of the support window. Um, upgrading the 170 clusters manually would be insane uh, because it would be a lot of work and very error prone. Uh, so it requires some custom toolings and automations. Uh, specifically, internally, we, we define this process uh, by following this blue-green upgrade process. Um, the blue-green upgrade process has two nice properties. We can validate the new Istio release before shifting the workloads over, and we can roll back quickly if the new version has some 
bugs or it doesn't interoperate with the old Istio version that we're currently running. So I want to show you a really quick animations of how the blue-green upgrade works. Uh, so we were on the same page. Uh, this uh, process is, is inspired by the Canary release that the Istio community um, proposed. But let's assume that every uh, all the Istio components is on blue right now. That includes the control planes and the sidecar proxy. The first thing we do is to deploy a new version of Istio control plane, call it green. And then we will select a subset of namespaces, change the, you know, the Istio revision namespace label to green so that a new version of sidecar proxy is injected. Uh, now, notice that we, we're running blue and green meshes at the same time in the same cluster. This is important because by separating the pair of cluster and client into the two meshes, we can test the interoperability of the uh, two versions of Istio's. Um, and the test is basically up to uh, your applications, like the sets of features that you use, MTLS, rate limiting, um, traffic shifting, et cetera. And lastly, we update the rest of the namespace to uh, the green mesh as well, and then eventually retire the blue control plane. Uh, so that's very intuitive. Uh, one caveat is that before we, re we retire the old control plane, we need to make sure that the client traffic, all the client traffic has been drained to the new uh, Istio gateways. And because we have essentially two separate deployments of Istio service meshes, the gateways are fronted by different sets of load balancers. And that's an issue because to drain the, uh, the client traffic over, uh, it just means that we, uh, the first implementation is to do a DNS cutover so that we uh, update the DNS 8 record for uh, the cluster ingress gateway to point to the new IP address of the new load balancer. And we can do it in a cloud agnostic way using cloud, uh, using external DNS, uh, which basically manage your DNS configuration uh, using Kubernetes annotation. Uh, this is a, a diagram of showing how the DNS update works. So on the upper hand side is me updating the DNS record through our authority NS server. And whichever DNS resolver eventually picks up that update and then I will return the new response to the client. And the response can be pointed to either blue or green load balancer. Now, there's a lot of issue with DNS. Uh, primarily because DNS, we have no control over client caching for DNS, uh, which is the second point right here where shift, traffic shifting using DNS is very ineffective. Um, in practice, we noticed that after we updated DNS records, after two weeks, there are still traffic hidden in the old um, load balancer, and there, there's nothing we can do about it. We basically just set a deadline, and then after that, we gave up and just uh, retire the old load balancer. Uh, but going back to the top, where uh, for some cloud provider, external DNS updates are not atomic. It's done by two API calls, delete and then update. It's possible for delete to succeed and then update to fail, so then, uh, essentially all the DNS resolution would return NX domain, um, and that's not great. And what's worse is that your client can cache the NX domain response indefinitely, um, and there's nothing you can change about it. And even if both a delete and update API calls succeeded, there's a five to 10 seconds delay between the two operations, and you're gonna get NX domain in those tiny window. So DNS updates, uh, not great. So how do we work around this, uh, this issue? Well, essentially, don't do DNS update, but how do we do that? Um, we can do so with a common set of load balancer that doesn't change with regards to either blue or green. Um, the way to re achieve this common set of load balancer is to define a service object without label selection and, and configure an endpoints object manually. Now, this is important because if you use a label selector on the service object, you can only select pods from the same namespace where the service resides. But because we have it's still blue and it's still green and they're from different namespaces, we do want to support pods from multiple namespaces. Uh, so that's why we're using service without a label selector 
and we're defining this endpoints object to uh, be a list of IP addresses of the selected pods, and which could be a mix of blue and green gateway pods. And we build a really simple controller that manage the endpoints object for us, uh, so we don't have to do this manually, because pods are by definition ephemeral. So here's a really quick animation of this common LB setup. Initially, uh, the common load balancer in orange points to the, uh, the blue Istio mesh. And then we deploy a new version of Istio. And notice that it still comes with its own load balancer. And those are ephemeral. They are there just for testing because we want to make sure that traffic can actually hit the uh, Istio green gateways. And in order to test the new gateways, they have to be behind some load balancer. But if we add it as a backend for the, the common load balancer in yellow, uh, they receive production traffic instantaneously, and that's not what we wanted. So we have to have a separate set of load balancer anyway, just for testing. And then we update the endpoints object within the Kubernetes cluster to select a different sets of gateway pods. And lastly, we retire the old uh, is the mesh and also the temporary green load balancer, and then all the production traffic are now hidden uh, is still green. And notice there's no DNS updates as part of the steps. Okay, well, it looks like I got some time, so I want to cover um, this kind of appendix that I prepared. Um, some open questions with multi cloud. Istio and Kubernetes would help with your multi-cloud adoptions, but it's not panacea. Specifically, there are issues um, that you just didn't address. For example, the application that's, that's using the cloud provider services still have to use cloud-specific libraries, and that means the same logic needs to be implemented three times if you want to support, say, the big three cloud providers. An example would be if your application writes to a blob storage bucket like S3 or GCS, um, or write to a message queue. Uh, it's the pod identity, uh, which on GKE is called workload identity, which translates a Kubernetes service account to a cloud service account or role, depends on your cloud provider. I mean, that only solves authentication authorizations to the cloud resources and doesn't solve the actual API calls of interacting with the cloud. And custom resource definitions can solve your resource provisioning, um, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't solve interactions of uh, your applications actually using the message queue or the bucket. Um, yeah, and cloud resources and policies that cannot be abstracted away by this cloud agnostic abstractions um, remain heterogeneous. For example, uh, in order to manage the uh, cloud DNS records and having an identity that is granted permissions to only create, say, tax records, um, that's something you cannot do with Kubernetes alone, and you have to provision the identities and policies in the respective cloud provider that you're on. Um, so with that, I think that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for being here and, and for your time. We're hiring globally, and if you're interested in multi-cloud, distributed systems, open source software, you can talk to me. Um, and yeah, thank you. And we have actually plenty of time for questions. Uh, we have a five minutes until break, but uh, after this, we have a break, coffee break, so you can get uh, coffee and uh, maybe water because you know coffee dehydrates, and you will, you know, want to sleep more after you drink enough coffee. But Questions, 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 questions over there. I will bring the microphone just a second. Uh, that canary upgrade trick without a DNS swing is awesome. Really cool. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that um, the X4 to 4 header is susceptible to spoofing. Did, um, I assume you tried setting num trusted proxies and it didn't work. Why didn't that work? I don't know. Uh, oh, okay. I think that's a decision imposed by the security teams, and that's a decision before my time. Um, but yeah. That, that, that sounds like something security teams would worry about. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Any uh, 
Other questions? All right, so in this case, uh, let's do uh, one more round of applause for Charles. And Thank I you. Believe, I believe